Chamo agora, então, a professora Maria Arménia Carrondo para falarmos da cristalografia na biologia. Boa tarde a todos. Eu gostava de começar por agradecer o convite que foi feito pelo professor Dario Moreira dos Santos e a Comissão Organizadora a estar aqui presente e a representar a biologia estrutural na, nesta sessão. Uh, já não está à mesa, mas uh, gostaria de cumprimentar todos os membros da mesa que estiveram na fase inicial. Há outro uh, aspecto que eu vou uh, mudar um bocadinho, talvez até ajude a captar a atenção dos participantes ainda nesta sessão, é que eu vou falar em inglês. Eu peço imensa desculpa, mas há termos que é muito difícil traduzir para português e eu corro, correria o risco certamente de usar traduções erradas, sobretudo perante um professor de bioquímica e alunos de bioquímica, que eu não me atrevo, de facto, a, a, a fazer. Portanto, eu vou falar em inglês e sobre a macromolecular crystallography em, em biologia. É, para começar, quer dizer, eu iria chamar a atenção What is structural biology and when did it start? Uh, nowadays, crystallography in biology, the general term is actually structural biology more than, as I mentioned, uh, crystallography in biology. And the landmark of, of the start of this era was indeed, uh, as it was mentioned already, the, 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 the model, the establishment of the model of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, Crickson and with the experimental data of Rosalind Franklin in 1953. They did not solve the structure of the DNA. This was solved by X-ray crystallography only years later, in 1981. But they, with the crystallographic data provided by Rosalind Franklin, they were able to establish the, a correct model that was later shown to be correct when the structure was solved. And why was this model so important? I guess everybody that works on molecular biology knows and biochemistry that uh, this allows to understand the, the replication, transcription, and translation of DNA. From this era, everything started, and, uh, uh, and this gave Watson and Crick son, because Rosalind was not alive then, alive then uh, the Nobel Prize in Physi Physiology and Medicine in 1962. So, so since then, and mainly now, it is very well established and known that structure is, is function, meaning that To really understand the function of a protein, you need to know the structure. Without knowing the structure, it is, I would say, impossible to know in detail how the molecule works in a certain organism. And this, uh, of course, is not a unique uh, um, observation or, or affirmation, but it goes forward and backwards because the structure Uh, gives rise to new studies uh, developing the function, and the function leads to new structure determinations and so forth. So, and this is how science develops, and this is very important, but uh, indeed the structure is the main basis to understand the function. So uh, what does structural biology provide uh, for the understanding of the function? It provides the description of the macromolecule at an atomic level. So what is really determined is the, how the molecules are constituted, constituted atom by atom and their 3D architre uh, architectural shape. Uh, and uh, with, with this uh, knowledge, it is possible to know wh what are the, which are the important parts of the molecule, where are the active centers, how it interacts with other molecules, and so forth. So it indeed allows um, mechanistic information of how the macromolecules and complexes function in biology. What are the methods nowadays used to obtain structural information is mainly X-ray crystallography is still the more potent method to, to use to obtain structure from macromolecules. But NMR is also very much used and is increasingly used nowadays. Cryo-EM is a very, very potent method and is being very strongly developed recently. Um, uh, mass spectrometry and biosacs also is also a very important method. 
Uh, it was already mentioned that uh, uh, crystallography allowed the um, winning of many Nobel Prizes, and in particular, structural biology was one of the strong points on, on these, uh, on these um, achievements. And here I'm not listing all the Nobel Prizes awarded to scientists in structural biology. I'm just pinpointing s uh, or selecting some of them and uh, starting by Crandrio uh, uh, and Perutz, which was already mentioned by solving the structure of hemoglobin and myoglobin. And then uh, Dorothy Hodkin, jo uh, Dysenhofer, Robert Hubert, and uh, Artmut Mikkel, which uh, the, the term the structure of the first the membrane protein, the photosynthetic reaction center. Later on, uh, Boyer, Walker, and School, which uh, allowed by their structure determination of the enzyme uh, um, sodium potassium ATPase to understand the synthesis of ATP. And uh, more recently, McKinnon with the discovering of channels in cell membranes, Kornberg in 2006 with the, the studies of molecular bases of eukaryotic transcription. And uh, in 2009, I believe everybody knows about this example, is the structure of the ribosome uh, worn by uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, Tom Stites, and other Jonas. And I like this in, in red because I will uh, take this example a bit further. And more recently, in 2012, uh, Kovic and Kobilka with the structure of the G protein and couple of receptors. So indeed, uh, um, Structural biology uh, is a very powerful methodology nowadays, and uh, is the basis of the most of the modern uh, bio biology and biochemistry. So as I mentioned, I'm going to pick up two examples, and I hope to be able to show you how the structure has allowed to understand the function, and vice versa. And uh, I picked one example from the literature, the, the structure of the ribosomes, and then uh, an example from our own work, sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> it's easier, was more at hand, to also show you these, these, um, the, these achievements. With the structure of the ribosomes, uh, I will try to illustrate their structure and correlate with the function as I mentioned. So everybody knows that ribosomes are very large complexes of proteins and RNA. Indeed, the ribosomes are the complex factory where the mRNA is translated and proteins are synthesized. And it is composed all of large and small subunits which can dissociate and reunite in, during the process of, of, of their function and, and, and of their work. What is very interesting is that ribosomes from all three kingdoms of life function according to very similar principles. And uh, many structures are already known nowadays. Uh, they really had a, a major development since 2009, but many more are known, known nowadays, in, including the human uh, ribosomes are being uh, determined, the structure. And what uh, the X-ray structure gives, tells us about the ribosome structure is they provide an immense insight into the general molecular and atomic details of plant synthesis and uh, in every organism on Earth. So we can understand how protein synthesis really occurs, and we couldn't understand that without the structure of the ribosomes, okay? And uh, more important, or not more important, but extremely important nowadays, it, it is the development of new antibiotics based on the structure of the, the ribosomes, of eukaryotic ribosomes and many others, there is a very strong investigation towards obtaining new antibiotics, which is very critical, as you know, nowadays. Uh, worth noting is that these structures, when they were first determined, were the largest asymmetric molecules sold by crystallography. So they are really huge molecules. So how is the, uh, the main function of the ribosomes is translation? And very briefly, uh, translation occurs in three steps, initiation, elongation, and determination. In the initiation is when the mRNA binds to the small subunit, and the first methionine tRNA, which is the substrate, binds to the P site, 
And then the large subunit comes and associates and forms a big complex. Then uh, the step which is repeated over and over again for the synthesis of the proteins is the elongation, where uh, when we have the mRNA bound to the ribosome, then it reads the codons on the, um, uh, provided by the mRNA and then uh, recruits uh, uh, the tRNAs that bring the correct amino acids related to that codon and comes to the A site. And then there is a peptidyl transfer to the ribosome, to the, the peptidyl transfer center in the ribosome. And then the, the whole system translocates and moves along one step further on the, uh, on, uh, on the mRNA. So uh, wh what happens is the pop polypeptide grows, the protein is being formed, and the ribosome travels along the mRNA. And this cycle, this process, or this step, is repeated uh, as many times as the number of amino acids present in a protein until uh, a stop codon appears in the mRNA, and then the process is stopped. Okay, stop codon appears, the polypeptide is released, and uh, there is the recycling process where all the components dissociate to be recycled. Uh, during this process, and I, of course, am not going, although you will see that in the film that I will show you, during this process, different protein factors are involved that catalyze various steps. The initiation factors, the elongation factors, the, the release factors, and the ribosome recycling factors. So there are several proteins that catalyze that kind of push to this kind of action um, in the ribosome. But first, uh, I would like to show you the structure of uh, uh, two subunits of uh, ribosome uh, 50S and 30S. The structure were determined by one of the, prize, the, the Nobel Prize winners, Ada Yonov, and published in 2009. This is from a uh, uh, bacterium de radio durans ribosome. And you can see here, uh, although it doesn't seem very large, but if you imagine that uh, the size of this, you can imagine by the following. Each part represented here on um, color are proteins, and the, the silver part are the RNA. So this is one protein, this is another protein, this is another protein. So normally we represent one protein in a big show, but here you have this huge complex, which is formed by the various components, as I mentioned, the RNAs and the proteins. And uh, uh, represented here the sites of binding of the substrate to the RNA, A, P, and E. On the other side, we have the small subunit of the same organism. And here represented, uh, as I highlight, we have the substrate in, uh, represented in a backbone shape. Uh, and in green, it is represented the part with the anticodon that would bind to the, to the large subunit matching the code of the mRNA, and in pink, the amino acid stem that would bind to the, these sites here on the uh, small subunit and delivers the amino acid to the peptidyl transfer center. Uh, as I said also, the structure of the ribosome uh, provided and uh, pushed for development of uh, many, uh, drug, uh, many new drugs because ribosomes are target for about 50% of the antibacterial drugs. So indeed, if you find a, a way of blocking the activity of the ribosome, you kill that organism, and therefore don't allow it to produce proteins any longer, and you can solve the problem, okay, of, 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 of the infection in that case. So uh, this is extremely important. And uh, for that purpose, the high resolution structures of the subunits have provided the, a new area of possibilities of structure-based drug design. And indeed, new and effective drugs in the brace against mainly the newly developed method of resistant, the resistance development is, is being uh, pursued and obtained, achieved. Here is uh, very briefly represented, again, the large subunit and small subunits the sites of int interaction of various antibiotics with the uh, ribosome subunits. Again, the publication from Ada Yonov. And, uh, but now this, is, this publication is from 2008. 
But nowadays, there are even more sites of interaction. And the various new sites of interaction can allow the development of new drugs and, uh, and uh, new actions to stop the activity of the hydrogen. So I will now show you a movie illustrating translation. This movie was downloaded from Venki Ramakrishnan website. And uh, important uh, to remember is that all molecules and complexes that are represented in this movie uh, their three-dimensional shape was determined by structural biology methods. So with this in mind, you can see what was achieved by knowing the structure of these molecules and complexes and so forth. Even dynamics events were also structurally characterized. Okay, here it comes. So this is uh, a copyright. Here you have the mRNA and the small subunit of the ribosome. Then the mRNA binds to the small subunit. The initiation, initiation factors come here. And you have the first step, the first methyl tRNA represented here. And then the large subunit comes in, forms a complex. And uh, the initiation factors are released. Again, this one here. And you have the elongation step starting, where you have the first uh, amino acid tRNA with uh, elongation factor to you coming in and binding to the A site, as you will see. Now, a hybrid state is formed when this uh, tRNA tries to move into the P site. OK. And the elongation factor is catalyzing the translocation here on the mRNA. It's a very visible scene. Okay. So these uh, are detailed parts of the elongation. And then you will see uh, a, f a 30 S open form oscillates between one open and closed form. And then you have the, these processes I mentioned repeated and over and over. Uh, for all the amino acids that constitute the protein, the polypeptide chain grows, comes out through this pocket, the, the, a pocket close to the pepti peptidyl transfer center, and uh, is being formed and uh, folded until a uh, stop codon arrives on the mRNA and uh, uh, a re release factor is linked and and the ribosome recycling factor comes in catalyzed by EF elongation factor F and as I mentioned all the complex is dissociated and the process restarts so I hope you enjoyed the movie which illustrates as I mentioned the, the importance of, uh, of the knowledge of the structure to understand the function of the of the uh, ribosome. In Portugal, we have structural biology mainly in the more developed the places where, where, it, where, where it has been developed for longer times is that it could be FCT, UNL, and I had BMC or no Porto, but now there is a small group in the Faculty of Mediter um, Medicine vet vet Veterinary at the University of Lisbon. And, uh, I will now show you very briefly an example from our own uh, study at, uh, at ITQB, which is an example um, uh, on the topic of bathogenesis of Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus lana, the la protein lana from the system. And uh, this is a project that uh, under the Harvard Medical School program that uh, and uh, was developed on a multi-team project by ITQB and that, that took part on the structural studies. The IMM did the in vivo studies and the group from the Harvard Medical School did the, the in vitro studies. Uh, so herpes virus family is a very a large family of uh, the DS DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses. And uh, it's important because uh, uh, establish, it established latency, dormancy in the host cell associated with different malign malignancies such as the Kaposi sarcomas associated tumor. 
During latency, the virus is persisted in the nucleus of those cells as an episome, and only a few genes are expressed. And indeed, the protein, which was the target of our project, LANA, the name is here, is one of the proteins that is expressed during this process of latency. So while the virus is uh, dorm dormant, is not developing, and therefore the, the infection is uh, kind of on a holding situation, but if this is disturbed, then the infection restarts, and so it's very important to understand how this takes place. Okay, here I'm representing only the interactions in the host nucleus during mitosis, and you can see here that the, the protein lambda, which is represented here in green, is a protein that links the virus genome, represented here as a circle, and the host chromosomes, represented here by this shape. So this protein is very important because it keeps the virus in the host cell, okay? And uh, if we want to understand how this happened, it's important to know the structure. So in a way, it allows the viral DNA to piggyback on chromosomes doing mitosis. Uh, there are other DNA tumor viruses similar to, to, to the Kaposi sarcomas, and uh, like the papil papilloma viruses, which is very well known by everybody, and they, they all also have similar proteins to the LANA protein. Uh, here is the sequence. I will not go very much onto that, but what we have done was the structure of the C terminal represented here. And we didn't, uh, uh, although we are also working on the human LANA, but for the moment we only solved the structure of the C terminal of the, the mouse model. The structure of the MLAN at 2.2 resolutions, this is the structure of the model, and I hope you understand the, the, these kind of representations of the protein structures. They are not atom by atom, by second, but by secondary elements, by, like helices, sheets, and loops. Uh, otherwise, it would be very complicated. The fold is similar to the fold of the Ebna 1 structure. Uh, they work uh, in vivo as a functional dimer, and the interface between the monomers is very important it, as it keeps thermostability between common to all these proteins. So what is our structure revealed in terms of the, the function? Uh, we have seen the two faces, as I indicated in the previous slide. There are two faces on the structure of this protein that we call ventral and dorsal face. And in the ventral phase, if we represent the electrostatic surface representation of the ventral phase, and for those who are used to these representations, these sites with color blue mean positive charges, with color red mean negative charges, and the, the white or intermediate means intermediate charges. So we see here two very large positive sites. And this... Uh, are probably the strong, uh, these two strong positive charges where we located phosphate ions are the possible site for interaction of the DNA with MLANA. So uh, this is in detail what we have on the, the interaction of these phosphates so that you can have an idea indeed then when we go to detail what kind of information we can obtain. So uh, we only solved the structure of lambda, not the complex, but we are able with the structure of lambda to build a, molecule, uh, a model with the structure of lambda plus the DNA. And the model is very stable and shows exactly that the DNA interacts with the lambda in the ventral site in the two places that I mentioned before with these positive charges, which is uh, what was, would be expected since the DNA has on the outside negative charges. On the other side of the molecule, where, where we, which we call the dorsal face of m lana we found to our surprise, and different from the similar proteins, a very large positive patch. And uh, we, uh, when comparing with the similar protein Ebna, this doesn't have the same uh, pattern at all, completely different. And uh, uh, what is the, the purpose, or, or what is the function, or why, why does this protein have this positive patch? 
Uh, then is, uh, w what happened was what I described at the beginning. Then uh, we gave this information to the other groups, the Harvard Medical School and the IMM groups, and they provided the targeted mutations in the ventral phase and also in the dorsal phase, and they were able by uh, biochemic studies to show that these mutations in the places, on in the residues that were shown to form this positive charge, uh, patches were able in one side to eliminate DNA binding and in the other side to also affect DNA binding and also have implications in latency. So the ventral side, we concluded the ventral side was the site for DNA binding and the dorsal uh, phase was the site for the association with the chromatin via a complex which is represented here by one of its molecules. So indeed uh, uh, the, our study and our structure had impact on viral latency and understanding viral latency. So uh, uh, the in very interesting aspect of this overall study that, that is that it combines structural, as I mentioned already, in vitro and cellular studies uh, that with an ADMA model that can offer a unique opportunity to investigate viral pathogenesis. This work all together with these uh, several contributions was published last year in PLUS Pathogen. And here is uh, the main uh, uh, people involved in that work. As you see, Pedro Simmons from uh, IMM, Ken Kane from Harvard, and from ITQB, uh, Colin McVeigh, Rajesh, and myself, and student Bruno. And I think it's Sarah here as well. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.